So it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for tonight, Lynn Eaton and Bob Vey. Lynn is the director of the University Library Special Collections Research Center and has been here at Mason since 2017. Um, a JMU grad, Lynn also has a master's in library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She loves working with the Mason community and helping to document the history of the university and Northern Virginia. If you have materials you think might be good for the university archives, please reach out to Bob or Lynn. And Bob and Lynn, if you wanna drop your contact information into the chat so people can um, see it and contact you, that'd be great. And if you don't know if your stuff would be good for the archives, reach out to Bob and Lynn and let them tell you. Um, and Bob Vey arrived at Mason in August of 1985 and with the exception of a few years has been here ever since. <laughs> he remembers when the Fairfax campus building stopped just east of Robinson Hall and Mason had an enrollment of only 15,000 people. Bob has a master's in history and a bachelor's in American studies, both from Mason. He finds our growth and development as an institution fascinating and fun to study and write about. He's currently an archivist in the Special Collections Research Center. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn you guys over to Bob and to Lynn, who have a great program lined up for you tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my camera off and I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint. So I'm going to first. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what is homecoming? Well, homecoming is a bit, it's a return to a place that we call home or we consider home. It's a celebration. Uh, some people associate it with a high school or a college athletic event um, or a homecoming court or something like that. Well, at, at, at Mason, uh, homecoming encompasses all of these things and more. Okay, so now Jen is going to, uh, I'm going to pass this over to Jen. She's going to share a short video of showing some homecoming events. Here you go. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right, here we go. You, Bob. And thank you. So the answer is no, we didn't always have homecoming at George Mason. Um, so Bob, uh, we don't have your presentation back up. Okay, let me go back, make sure here. Um, let me make sorry. Okay, and how about now? There you go. Okay, great. I think I was too hasty with the, uh, <laughs> too hasty there. It's okay. Okay, so did we always have homecoming at Mason? No, uh, unfortunately not. Um, homecoming uh, it didn't really start until, in, until really kind of our third decade as uh, uh, in Northern Virginia. Uh, but in order to understand, we wanna take a little trip through the history of uh, George Mason. Okay, so George Mason begins in 1957 
as a little eight room elementary school building in Valley's Crossroads. Uh, we were a branch of the University of Virginia and our initial enrollment was 17. Yes, 17. In 1964, we moved to Fairfax. Uh, the first four buildings are shown here. They were called North, South, East, and West. Uh, when we opened in the fall of 64, there were a total of 356 students at George Mason. And George Mason was really only a two-year community college at that point. Um, in 1966, Mason was promoted as a four-year degree-granting college, but we were still part of UVA. So in 1968, Mason graduates its first class. Um, there were 52 members of the class of 1968. And this class actually uh, created the first George Mason Alumni Association. So George Mason College of the University of Virginia becomes George Mason University on April 7th, 1972. Uh, here's Virginia Governor A. Linwood Holton Jr. signing the bill that made us independent. And by the way, Governor Holton is the father of Mason's Shar School professor and university president, Emerita Ann Holton. Let's fast forward to 1978. George Johnson becomes president of George Mason University. And for you younger alumni, uh, the JC was named for him. He wasn't named after the building. Uh, Johnson felt when he got here that the university had not distinguished itself or stepped out of UVA's shadow uh, in its first six years as an independent institution. He also thought Mason had very little going on in terms of how it interacted with the public, the area business community, and even its own alumni. Uh, it needed to step up its engagement with the local community and its alumni. So now as, as both a graduate and an administrator at older and more traditional colleges and universities, Johnson no doubt experienced several homecoming celebrations himself. Uh, he had surely been, surely seen the value of uh, strengthening the bonds to alumni in the community. So six months after taking the helm at Mason, Johnson added additional staff to its development and alumni affairs office. And as a result of this growing new focus on alumni, the university held its first major alumni event, uh, the very catchy titled Alumni Day. Uh, it took place on December 8th, 1978. Uh, it began with a proclamation by Fairfax Mayor Fred Silverthorne uh, and continued with an alumni reception with President George Johnson, uh, reunions for alumni, the Mason versus JMU basketball game in the PE, PE building, and finally, a victory celebration in the RAT. Uh, unfortunately, we lost 77 to 64. So during the 1978-79 season, um, George Mason University basketball was promoted from the NAIA to the NCAA Division I. Now, most of our uh, NCAA D1 games um, that we played had to, been, had to be played on the road because we really didn't have a decent stadium. Um, we didn't have a, 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 an actual basketball stadium until 1984. Uh, so we played in the gym of the PE building. Uh, this venue was no bigger than a high school gym and held under a thousand spectators. Um, but Mason was playing D1 basketball and a member of our athletics department was quoted as saying that there had been an increase in interest on the part of alumni and Fairfax residents in the basketball program. It was becoming clear that George Mason University should have a homecoming as part of its tradition. So 
So this was the state of George Mason University in 1980. We had an enrollment of about 9,500 students. They were primarily commuters. Um, we had 500 students living on campus. We had just built dorms in 1977, uh, our first dorms rather. Um, the average age of a student was 26 years old. 80% uh, of our students worked full-time or part-time. Uh, more than half of our students were part-time students and one third of our students were married. Uh, so it's safe to say that George Mason was far from a traditional university at that point. Okay, so here's a, an aerial photograph of Fairfax campus in 1980. Uh, as you can see, the university essentially, essentially stopped right there at the back door of Robinson B. Um, everything from Robinson B all the way out to Braddock Road was a deep forest. Uh, on the right in the center of the picture, you can see they're just starting out David King Hall, if anyone remembers that. And that's, of course, still there. Um, so in the fall of 1979, the Development and Alumni Affairs Department and the in individual academic departments teamed up to work on plans for a formal homecoming event. And the group would put together a slate of events that would last three days beginning on February 8th, 1980. They would take place primarily at the Fairfax campus and North campus over on Route 50 in Fairfax. Um, all events would be open to students, alumni and the, and the public. And so some of the events included um, a concert by the Skip Castro Band um, which was a local, well, a very popular college band from Charlottesville, and they would uh, barnstorm up and down the, uh, the Commonwealth playing a lot of colleges, and very popular. And actually, they're still around in some, some fashion right now. Um, there was also uh, a talk by Dr. Lillian Anthony Welch, um, and she was director of minority affairs at George Mason. And there was also a performance by the Old Dominion Brass and the latter two events took place in Fenwick Library, by the way, my home, our home. And rounding out the smaller events at the, at the, on the docket were tours of the university, open houses and receptions in the academic departments, and also a piano concert by a Russian-born virtuoso. So promotion for Mason's first homecoming came in many forms. Um, here is an official, uh, an official university press release. These things were typed up back then. There were articles uh, in numerous Washington area newspapers. There was a full page ad in the back fold of Broadside, the student newspaper. And um, it seems like their graphics kind of follow the ye olde um, style there. And one of my favorites were the homemade flyers that were made um, on campus and then distributed through the university unions and some of the academic departments. So there are, uh, there, there were a set of three and we have all of them in our department. We have those in our collection. Main attractions were the pregame party held in the PE building. And here's President George Johnson uh, talking up a guest uh, at the uh, pregame um, uh, mixer, alumni mixer. Uh, yeah. Of course, there was a DJ <laughs> and uh, he was literally spinning records. Uh, he was from the world of sound DJs. And here are a group of alumni, uh, alums, 
hanging out and and literally this was in an auxiliary gym in the pe building and just noticed the three-piece suit and the turtlenecks i mean they're it, it different from the different from some of the homecomings we all remember where we're all kind of decked out in mason gear and and um they they you know they they remember our 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 uh our alumni base was probably a little older than most colleges at the time. Um, but most importantly was the game, the basketball game that we played against Mercy College. And it took place in the PE building, the gym there. Um, we won a, a thriller 70 to 68. And um, it was so good that 10 months later, that same year in December, we held another homecoming. Uh, so that became ingrained in our, in, uh, in George Mason tradition. Um, by 1990, homecoming was moved to late October and the homecoming game was, uh, was actually a soccer match in George Mason Stadium. And uh, this kind of allowed it to be an outdoor event. Um, it was a little warmer in October. Um, and we had a full uh, NCAA regulation track. So they used the track for the homecoming parade. They could take the, the floats around, and, around the track as part of the homecoming parade. And as you can see in the background in the large picture in the upper part, there are some floats. There's uh, one that I can't ID. There's the Teak's float right behind it, which looks like a carton of milk. And there's another float that I really can't make out either. Um, and our soccer team was pretty darn good too. And we, um, we routinely uh, socked it to the University of Virginia, keep both here and in their own stadium. Um, as you can see in the upper right-hand part of the picture, there's homecoming king Archie Kao and Queen Christina Bartlow. Now Archie Kao went in, went on to star in the original CSI television series uh, as one of the CSIs, and uh, also he was the Blue Power Ranger in that movie franchise. Uh, I don't think he would be that recognizable, uh, but but definitely if you watch the old CSI, you would see him as the one guy in the lab that we go to every third week or so for some input. Um, uh, here is, here's another shot of homecoming. This one's in 97, where they had an indoor event. This must be the crowning of the homecoming court. And this appears to be in the basement of the Johnson Center. Um, <clears throat> So by 1999, the focus of homecoming, uh, the homecoming game was back to basketball. Our team was starting, was beginning to rise in the, uh, 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 in terms of clout. And um, uh, so they made homecoming basketball game again, uh, where it has remained ever since 1999. Now this is an early 2000s homecoming game against GMU. Uh, and while the, while the basketball team was victorious in that very, very first homecoming game way back in 1980, uh, I think the real winners were the alumni, students, local residents who came to George Mason that weekend to celebrate a common bond, uh, that Mason was home. Okay, now I'd like to turn the second part of the program over to my colleague, uh, Lynn Eaton. Thanks, Bob. That was great. That was very informative um, and great images. So I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we're going to have a discussion. I'll be asking them some questions. And if you have questions that you'd like to have some information about, just type it into the chat and we'll add those in as we can. Um, starting off, and I'm just doing this not in any alphabetical order. Um, we have Avania, and who graduated in 2015. 
with a bachelor's degree in marketing and is the marketing manager at Array and co-owner of Baked a la Carte. And she resides in Woodbridge, Virginia. And I am interested in the Baked a la Carte. Um, Carrie Chapman, who graduated in 1998, and we found out that she was on the homecoming court when she was there. Congratulations, Carrie. That's cool. Um, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in history, and she's a director of enterprise systems and integration services and in IT at Washington and Lee University and resides just north of Lexington, Virginia. David Atkins who graduated in 1990 with a bachelor's in decision sciences, is the executive director of licensing, marketing, and administration at Mason and resides in Manassas, Virginia. And last but not least is Kathy Lemon, who graduated in 1986 with a bachelor's in communication and in 1993 with a master's in professional writing and editing and is an IT project manager with the Fairfax County government and is a lifelong resident of Manassas, Virginia. So welcome you guys to the panel. Um, I'm gonna start off with the question, what was your favorite thing about homecoming while you were in school and after graduating? Um, I can start, unless there is an order to it. Nope. Awesome. Well, I come from France, so when I first moved to the United States and came to Mason, I had no idea what homecoming was. I didn't know what a tailgate was. What, what does it even mean? Homecoming, tailgate, tail of an animal? I had no idea. And I, of course I Googled. And then when I Googled, I thought, oh, that's like the American movies that I used to watch in France. That's so cool. Does Mason have it? And then I was told, obviously, yes, this is when it's happening. So then I participated in a tailgate when I was a George Mason University student, undergrad student. And I just, at first, I didn't understand why are we gathering, you know, under the rain, what, what's going on until I went there. And once I went there, I saw the spirit, how just the joy and the get together and having a good time all together Everybody was wearing a Mason outfit. It was so cool. And I can't believe that day I was not wearing a Mason outfit. But from that day on, I understood the value of having homecoming and I participated in those events. And then from the alumni side, I found out that we actually do kind of the same things, but more on the classy side. So with hors d'oeuvre and like <laughs> champagne, like it's a little classier. So it's perfect for someone who's graduating and you know, who wants to go on the other side. You're not under the rain anymore perfect and again the spirit was there and this is part of american dream i mean when i came i would not have thought that a new university would have that much of a spirit and i felt like this is truly something that you can only experience in america so that's my experience <laughs> nice thank you very much so <clears throat> I will give a little bit of a different perspective <laughs> um, because honestly, I did not think homecoming started until 1990. So I just learned today that it existed uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, so that does lend. I started at Mason in, in 1985 and I was not aware of any type of homecoming activities. Um, and so I thought homecoming actually started like a semester after I graduated, uh, which was in spring of 1990. Uh, but so I recall my first homecoming and I think it was 2007, af 2007 after the final four run. And so I was so excited about going and I went there with the intention <laughs> It's a little shameful, but with the intention to be published in the Mason magazine after the event. And so what I did, because I knew, you know, they wanted to see a lot of spirit, very similar to what you just said, Ava, a lot of campus spirit. So I put face paint on my face, GMU. <laughs> And I knew when the photographer saw me, he would take a picture. And as soon as he took it, I was with one of the past presidents of the uh, Black Alumni chapter there. And I said, I will be in the magazine now. 
<laughs> and it was published in the magazine. <laughs> so that, that's one of the things that I do remember. <laughs> I need to get that picture. <laughs> Actually, I have the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're waiting to see it, David. Yeah. Put the next Mason spirit. Carrie, so you... David had a similar um, experience. So I started Mason in 1982, and, and I too had no notion of the homecoming. Um, basketball was a big thing, but obviously homecoming was associated with soccer. As I told some folks earlier, um, in the 80s, you know, the bigger thing on campus was Patriot Day and Mason Day. And probably because of Mason Day, the beer trucks rolled up on the quad and you had live bands all day. Um, so that's really where uh, the camaraderie was and the spirit happened around those two events. Uh, I got involved in homecoming though, when I joined the alumni board in 1996. So I've not missed a homecoming since. I was on the board for 10 years. So I've had uh, now experience on both sides, being a board member and, um, now just being a member of the, of the association, greater association. So um, it's fascinating that we all have these different experiences. And I too learned a lot, Bob, from your presentation. So thank you very much for the history lesson. Yeah, and I, I think um, it sort of echo a little bit of what, what Kathy said, Mason Day, and I graduated in 98. You know, Mason Day was, was the big thing right? Um, that was the big party. But as I mentioned in the chat, um, in 97, that was really in the in the four years I was at Mason, that was the first year that they really expanded homecoming for students beyond traditional Greek organizations. Um, it was usually a very big social Greek um, sports thing. And they expanded it to other student organizations. And so I was part of um, Alpha Phi Omega, it was the service fraternity. And so we nominated people for the homecoming court and like the program board nominated people and you know um, the, the other organizations. And so, yes, APO. And so um, it was really cool. We had the parade on Sweetheart Circle. So instead of just on the track, we actually went around, or not Sweetheart Circle, oh my gosh, um, Patriot Circle. I don't know where that came from, um, thinking about Valentine's Day, um, but around Patriot Circle. And uh, we were, I remember with, with Stefan, we were riding on the back of a Mazda Miata, hoping we didn't fall off or get beer cans thrown at us. Um, and there was a dance afterwards, but it was, and they, there was a reception at the president's house. Um, so um, Alan and Sally Merton were, um, were president and first lady at that point in time. And so the homecoming court got to go to the house and and it was it was interesting because we were all dressed up and and uh, dr merton and mrs merton were were not they were jeans and polo shirts and it was it was a cool juxtaposition to see typically from what you what you saw and as an alum i think uh, I, the point was made about uh, bringing it indoors um you know having it a little bit more cush a little bit more champagne taste um, was nice especially once i had kids and was bringing them along as a kids area to play. And um, so all the alumni kids are getting to know each other. So, um, and, and I'm wearing some of my favorite gear that was from, so that's a uh, uh, don't, yeah, don't, don't need any Ruby slippers. That was uh, from 2011. So um, I think the swag was one of my favorite things as an alum getting all the all little free stuff, so. And Bob, what was your favorite? thing about homecoming while you were in school and after graduating? Yeah, see, my, ex I mean, I was aware of homecoming, but remember now, I am a, I was a commuter for my entire seven years of college at George Mason, my seven year undergraduate. <laughs> so um, I, I, I often went, got my education, went home because I had a job waiting for me at 5.30 in the afternoon. So I didn't do a lot of hanging out on campus um, in a traditional way. So my homecoming memories are from when I came back as an employee. And, and I can just tell you now, my 17 year old daughter probably has just as many homecoming experiences as I have, because that was a yearly thing, my wife and I. And as a matter of fact, if you look at my background, the section over to the right, uh, I, I can't see myself, but that's where we are to the left of the band uh, is where we used to sit. We used to ask for those seats. I had a friend who would give us the hookup and we would sit right there because we liked the band and we wanted to hang out with the band. And we would sit right there probably for seven, eight years in a row that we sat over there. 
and uh, probably my best my best memory is um and i'll try to make this clean it up a little bit is we were playing in a game against unc wilmington homecoming game and i don't know if anybody remembers that game but it went down to the last second and the uc uh unc wilmington player was driving to the hoop and apparently there was a foul with no time left and <clears throat> uh the they called a foul on our player and all of a sudden 10,000 people in the stands started yelling BS, 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 really loud. So I'm sitting right there in the end zone and I can see where our Dr. Merton sits because Merton, if anybody remembers, Merton would sit uh, right on the side, right on, uh, right on the wood right there, right next to the end line. And uh, just uh, probably about 30 yards to my left. And everybody was screaming and I looked over at the Mertens and Alan Merton was standing up going bullshit, bullshit <laughs> and wait, waving his fist. So Dr. Merton really got into the games, if you remember. And there was the other time when I was at a, a game when one of our players hit a last second, uh, last second shot to end the game. And it might've been against VCU. That's why I counted a lot. And the team mobbed him and Dr. Merton fell on top of the pot <laughs> on the court. So that was one of the things I really enjoyed was watching, you know, watching Alan Merton because I'm, because Sally probably was probably, you know, embarrassed a little bit to see Alan Merton getting into the games and actually jumping on, you know, uh, rushing the court and things like that. But th those are my, that's my favorite memory is Alan Merton leading the BS cheer at the end of that game. Nice. Well, it seems like there's a lot of um, alumni involvement. And I'm just wondering, in your experience going to your, the homecoming after you graduated, did you see a lot of student involvement or did you see it grow over, oh, over time? Oh, I can say absolutely. Um, particularly from the board's perspective, because we obviously were in a lot of events during the course of the week. But you could see once they did the outdoor tailgate, right, and they gave the students their own little section with their covered bags and drinks and all. Um, but you could see every year it was just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and probably the one I remember most is the first year we had to move inside because of the weather and the fire marshal uh, put the kibosh on the tent outside. So we moved inside. And, but those students were still out there. Bless their hearts. I mean, as cold as it was, as windy as it was, they, they were going for it. And, and I'm like, you know what? I'm older and wiser. I'm going inside. <laughs> uh, but yes, you can see it. And it's, it's great. Obviously, the whole spirit thing all through the week. You've got the t-shirts. You've got the competitions, you know. Um, even at the county last year, so I'm in Fairfax County, and in my group of 10 people, five of us went to Mason. And so we decorate our pods. I put the beads up on everybody's pods. So yeah, so it's it's kind of cool. This just gets bigger and bigger and better and better. I would agree. I would agree uh, with everything Kathy said and would add that one of the elements that um, I notice that uh, students, alumni, and community all, all together um, really enjoyed uh, was the um, fireworks that were done over the Mason Pond after the basketball game. Um, I know at some point it, it stopped. I don't know whether or not people began to question how do we celebrate with fireworks if we actually lost the game? But anyway, <laughs> it was a wonderful thing to watch. <laughs> you celebrate the effort, David. There you go. We're celebrating the effort. <laughs> It'd be nice to have the fireworks back. Fireworks were fun, it, especially when, when the Mason Inn was open. And you know you could stay if you were traveling, which we never lived in Northern Virginia after graduation. Um, if you were traveling, it was just it was the spot for a couple of years. Like that's where you ran into everybody after the game. They hosted the other event we haven't talked about is the alumni beer tasting. Can we just say that that was always a good time? Um, 
but but yeah, the students were really, I mean, in my alumni experience, it was just always happening outside, you know, and I was torn for a couple of years between wanting to be warm um, and wanting to be out there in the middle of the of the fun. Um, and so it just, it, it really impressed me. And my, my um, classmates around, around, graduated around the time that I did, we, we marveled over how involved the students truly have become um, and how much spirit they have. Because you know, when, when I was a student, there were about 3,000 maybe who lived on campus and we, were, we would see each other all the time. And so we knew, you know, we knew each other, we knew we were the residents and, and still a lot of commuter students. But yeah, it was, it was, it, it's been, been really cool, but yeah, that the beer tasting and then recently having sort of the, the indoor um, tasting garden with alumni owned mm -hmm. um, breweries and wineries and distilleries has been really, really fun. Good idea. Bob, do you have any other memories about that in terms of students, undergrad? Um, yeah, see that again. That's a tough one because um, I never really experienced homecoming as a student. Um, I never came back to the campus on weekends or Friday nights or anything like that. So it was, you know, it was again. I was very aware of it, and but you know, I grew up in Woodbridge, Virginia. So anybody. George Mason at that time, and we're talking mid 1980s, um, was a great landing place for a Northern Virginia high school student. Um, I didn't have big aspirations, like to, oh, I'm gonna go to William & Mary and study law or something like that. I mean, I changed my major. I went to school for seven years to get my undergrad. I quit school and I came back. Um, so I knew as, you know, as, as a commuter, a bunch of my neighbors were also George Mason students, <laughs> you know, they're just, you know, everybody, we would all talk about what's going on, in, you know, at school and, you know, and I remember some of the older, older students, um, or, the, you know, the older, my older neighbors who were going to Mason, they would talk about going to homecoming. Um, and, but I just really, I don't know. I guess I just I didn't really know what I was missing. I think as a as a as a 19 year old growing up in Northern Virginia. And uh, I think we should try to like, I guess, publicize or promote the homecoming and targets to students maybe more often, because again, as an international student, I had no idea what this was, and I wouldn't have went unless I was <clears throat> dragged there. And but once I was there, I thought, wow. I missed last year. That no way. Why did I miss this? Yes, it's raining. Yes, it's cold. But the spirit is so good, and it only happens once a year. Like you have to be there, and it's it's a cultural thing too. I really enjoy seeing it and being part of it. So yeah, I would love it if more international students at Mason get to know what what they will be experiencing at homecoming, so that they get. Uh, like a wheel want to go there and experience something very different from probably their culture. They may come from um, Asia, Middle Eastern Europe, where this thing is not common at all. Mm -hmm. And it's very different. It's a new culture. And it, it would be great if more international students get to join and experience and be part of this new culture. I'm wondering, uh, since you, you're the most recent graduate, if you recognized student organizations being involved beyond, you know, like, so what, what, what really hits you with that, with the student organizations? Yeah. So actually I've noticed a lot of, um, a Greek life mm -hmm. students. I wasn't in any, I just still, because I guess the cultural difference, I didn't understand why I should be part of the Greek life. I didn't understand it, but I saw so many groups getting together, but then I saw when the student organizations and the Greek life would get together, it wasn't uh, secluded like different groups. It was like a melting pot where everybody would be basically interacting with each other, having a good time. So that, that was also the beauty of it is a melting pot. It's not like a salad bowl where you have each student organizations in one corner, each Greek life 
in one corner everybody was having the spirit all together and i love seeing this so to me this was also one of the definition of america <laughs> the observation just a, so, a quick a quick note if you don't mind i see that karen swiger posted 2007 was the first year of the beer tasting now that explains why i was so open to putting face paint on my face <laughs> <laughs> The truth comes out. David, I was going through my pictures from homecoming in years past and 75% of them I could not share because they were related to the beer tasting. There you go. Hermina probably knows what I'm talking about. But David, it's really funny. I do have, um, did, I don't know if people remember and I can't remember what year it was, but it was the indoor tailgate and the fire alarm went off in the, in the Johnson Center. Uh -huh. And it was bitterly cold and we all got stuck outside. And I actually have a photo that I took of the crowd and David is right behind me, which is <laughs> kind of funny. We were all just, I mean, I know, I know the staff was panicking, but it ended up being fun. It's one of those yep. things you just talk about for years. So yep. I have to see if I can find that picture. <laughs> so over the, over the times that you've been there, both as an undergraduate, if you were involved or, and later, what do you think has been the most significant change in homecoming over those years? Well, I haven't been in that many years, but what I've seen over the few years are the social media posts. I feel like every year there is more and more, there are more and more students and alumni posting uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, the day of really. So everybody is. And then when I look at my Instagram or Facebook page, for example, I just scroll down and it's just keep going and going pictures of Mason students or Mason alumni at the event and take group picture and they all are wearing Mason uh, gears and having the yellow and green um, paint on their face. So that's what I've noticed uh, has increased over the years. Yeah, I would, I would guess that it's become much more polished and um, you know what I mean? It's definitely it's it's definitely a very uh, polished uh, set of events. There's there's a there's a great website. They offer a lot of things. There there are some good themes and and graphics and things like that. Um, I, 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 just go back and look at the the one I showed you from 1980, where literally people drew their own posters or drew their own flyers and then they hung them up in you know, like sub, sub one, they didn't have a sub two back in 1980. So it was the student union building is what they called it. Um, and in the library and in Robinson Hall. So, so it's definitely become uh, something that you can instantly identify by, you know, by the, 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 I don't want to say marketing, but just by the, um, the motifs that they've developed over the years. <clears throat> I would say it's definitely be, it's in sub two in 1982, by the way, Bob. Um, <laughs> well, that's on me. That was the first, no, that was the big thing. It was a brand new building. It was the one new building when I started my freshman year. That was the big hype for sub two. Um, I would say that as the university has grown and the, and the greater community has grown around Mason, so is homecoming, right? Where you first targeted alumni and you really saw, I think, um, and this, from my perspective on the board, you really saw in the um, 2000s more and more the student involvement. And then now I, when I go, I see it's this greater, bigger community around the university. So you've got, and the most fantastic thing about basketball is that it really is a family event. And there are a whole lot of people who go to that game who were never students, right? Mm -hmm. But because I was talking to somebody who sit next to me at a game once, he's like, no, I, I come here because it's affordable. It's a, it's a good, clean thing to bring my family to and we can afford it, right? And he was a homecoming game. So as, it's, as the university has grown, our community has grown, so has homecoming. And it has kind of morphed and almost, I think, adapted to the growth of the university. And it's, and it's almost, as Bob said, you have all of the publicity now, you've got almost something for everybody through all the events. So I think it's fantastic. And I would add, there is definitely, definitely an elevated um, level of 
uh, campus spirit uh, around homecoming um, and involvement. Uh, and one of them, I'm, I'm seeing Teresa Dawson write, um, the homecoming banners. I remember in the JC on the rails, just seeing the student organizations uh, with their design homecoming banner, because I think they would run some type of competition around that. So it was just awesome to see that type of engagement uh, competition uh, and the creativity around that. Uh, the other thing that I have noticed that, and um, it kind of ties into uh, what Kathy kind of said, there's something for everyone. And so now I see more affinity type of events for different groups and populations to draw them into the celebration. And then I think more recently, I've been seeing more um, partnership uh, with the uh, city of Fairfax uh, in terms of how they are engaging and offering uh, discounts to alumni and students and faculty and staff to come and celebrate beyond just the, uh, the walls or the boundaries of the campus. Oh, and Jen's noting there's a big homecoming banner yep. in the town square. <laughs> So I wanted, there's not a whole lot of time left, but I wanted to open it up to see if anybody else uh, would like to have any questions answered or had any inquiries. Um, I love that formal presentation in the beginning, like how we did it a few years ago, the formality and um, the king and queen. And I thought this was really cool. Um, is that something that, I don't know, maybe we can bring back but I thought it's very classy, very cool. Again, very American. It's like in the movies, you know, when we, I used to watch at least um, in Europe. Um, very cool. So maybe we can bring it back. The, um, I'll speak to that a little bit. The king and queen went away a few years back when we had, um, I believe a transgender or um, yeah, transgender or transsexual that had won for Miss Mason. And so then the following years, they decided that it would just be a Mason person, just one person named as the crowned person for homecoming. I'm not sure if that stayed true the last couple of years. Is that still happening? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they do crowning of any nature now. Yeah. And yeah. I think, so the following year they did the person who was, um, I don't know what they called it, but it was just the Mason. Mason, Mason, Mason Majesty, I believe it was. Mason Majesty. Thank mm -hmm. you, David. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that they continued that for a couple of years after, but they decided to get away from King and Queen just to be mm -hmm. more, I think, inclusive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think, and, and thank, uh, thanks for bringing it up, Carol. It's been a long time. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Carol. <Thank> you. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I, I was at that game where they introduced the homecoming queen and everybody just totally um, loved it. I don't know if anybody was, else was at that game. There were 10,000 people at that game. And everybody totally dug it. And this person did what a, a just wonderful walk with everything, if you remember. And it was it was so it, everybody just loved it. And then the next day, there were so many reports in the newspapers. And then there were so many uh, some negative stuff. And it made the national news all over the place. Uh, some negative, some positive. But everybody kind of knew that, you know, that, that that had happened that that weekend. But um, we all loved it. I mean, we were just we we everybody in my section was just was loving it. You know, it was it was it was very cool. That was one of the few years I was inside. And I remember some confusion about that. And we all said the student body votes and they voted for her. Mm -hmm. So that was really, I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Is there anything else that has not 
like has dropped off that people are like, oh, I would really like that to come back? I believe Teresa in the comments had mentioned she would love to see the parade and the fireworks come back. Ah. I vote for that. I think those are awesome. Go ahead. And the soaker. That would be cool too. You would have to have two homecomings if you had soccer. <laughs> remember, soccer ends in December. <laughs> and that's assuming we do really well, it ends in December. <clears throat> yeah, one, one element of the, the indoor tailgate in particular that I, I love is um, when the band comes in, you know, when, the, when the, the drum line comes in, the cheerleaders come in, the Patriots there. It just, you, whether you have kids or you don't it's just a extraordinary moment when you hear the drums um start playing and i have so many videos of my my toddlers dancing you know when when the green machine comes in and i've i've got pictures of the kids with doc nicks and and the patriot and the cheerleaders and they just they love it yeah ty i, I miss seeing you too <laughs> um you know and and it just there's, and it was like, everybody was waiting. Like we gotta make sure we're in the room when the band comes in. So um, always a good time. And for the, on the student side, uh, it's really nice that Mason offers transportation. The Mason buses just help a lot um, for people like that are commuting. So they can commute using those buses so they don't have to drive there. And where they're, when they're doing the tailgating, they don't you know, have to worry about how am I going to get back home. Um, Mason offers the transportation and it's getting more and more extended, I've noticed, which is really awesome. Um, and I think it will keep getting extended over the years, I guess, when there is more demand for location like stops. But that was my favorite thing. I used the Mason uh, bus system all the time. And it's really nice that they also have later hours, earlier hours. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorite things. Okay, we have about three minutes left. Any other memories that anybody wants to share from their favorite homecoming? Um, how about anybody that was around during the final four? I mean, that would have been early in the final four run that season, but what was magical about that season for that homecoming? Does anybody have rem memories? memories of that particular homecoming that obviously led to the final four run? Yeah, we had won 10 games in a row between January and February. And one of our last games that we had won in a row leading up to that, that homecoming was a what they call a bracket buster game uh, in, uh, I forget that, it's a Missouri Valley team, uh, Wichita State. And we had won a game in, an, in a very hostile stadium with those yellow things bopping around and clapping and stuff like that. They're yellow too, um, Wichita State. And we won that game and we ended up, we got in the top 25 after winning that game. So we came back for homecoming and we were just, and I don't remember what happened in homecoming, but we did so well that spring, but that was like, Part of our 10 game winning streak was that game against Wichita State, which was away, of course. But um, that, yeah, everything was pretty lit in 2006. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, very, mu very much so. And actually, so I was president of the Alumni Association in 2006. And so I, I, and that was the most amazing thing about the whole experience, right? At the Wichita, Wichita State, I believe we had a pep rally. And the, the energy, I think, from winning that particular game just magnified the energy at homecoming, right? Everybody was hyped. It was like you were at the tailgate, and it was like everybody was so excited. Everybody was talking in a higher-pitched voice, and the game was just, you couldn't hear yourself think at the game because it was just so high energy. Um, it was just, that's, the most, that's the thing I can't remember the most about homecoming was just everybody was so hyped my ears hurt when I got home because it was just that loud. 
everywhere you went. Um, it was incredible, just incredible. And that continued, right? The energy we got off the Wichita State game carried into a homecoming that just carried us on through. And it just, like it grew and grew and grew. And I think the most amazing thing of this all, and Dr. Merton will say this, I know he, he said it many times, um, is that it showed too just how well behaved the entire Mason community could be, right? We could, we weren't set up on fires, right? Homecoming was high energy, but it was good, right? It was safe. And that was the most miraculous thing of that entire time, right? I and mean, you can see the Mason police presence, you know, the Fairfax police presence kind of grew a little bit more because of the pep rallies and the homecoming got bigger and bigger, but you had all this energy, but everybody was good. Everybody was happy, right? Nothing bad happened. Yeah. Unlike other schools around this area. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that is a great place to end um, with great memories of the final four. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, this, this was a very exciting walk down memory lane. Um, we learned a lot from our panelists. Um, so David's a camera hog and we'll do anything to get into <laughs> um, <laughs> But seriously, thank you. It's great to see so many people from the board, past members of the board. Um, for those of you who don't know Carol Swigart, who was giving us history, she used to work here and she used to work for Mason. So yay, Carol. Um, and um, it, it's just, it's great to see everybody. And it's great to have this much enthusiasm and participation over Zoom, because I know over the last year, people have Zoom fatigue. But with this being our first virtual homecoming, um, hopefully our last. <laughs> um, it, it is great to see so many people come on, come back, share your memories. And thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. Thank you again to the board who puts in so much time making, you know, the Alumni Association tick. Thank you to the Alumni Relations team who has stood up a almost 29 event virtual homecoming. Um, and they've attended pretty much all of them in one way, shape or form. So um, kudos and most importantly, thanks Lynn for putting this presentation together so that we could walk down the lane. Um, I think everybody learned something about homecoming. Um, don't know that we wanna bring back the sock hop or the colonial knickers that they <laughs> <laughs> but there could be some novelty um, to having handmade flyers again. So uh, we'll see where the artistic talent lies. I know Ava is our resident marketing expert, so maybe she can draw up some flyers for us for next year. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, have a great night. We have a mindfulness session happening at six and then um, the old school throwback with the Latino alumni chapter. And we've got um, you know the virtual tailgate if you're still coming. Uh, even though the game is canceled, the virtual tailgate is still happening. So please, please, please. It's fun games, bingo, trivia, the whole nine yards. The game can be gone, but fun still continues. Um, check out the Black Alumni Chapters Happy Hour tomorrow night and their brunch on Sunday. And with that, I will leave you and say, happy homecoming, go Mason. And uh, Thanks, one, quick up, one quick update, uh, Ty wrote the, that the mindfulness and well-being event is actually at 7 p.m. tonight, seven. not I'm 6 sorry. p.m. So nope, you're thank fine, you, just Alexa. wanted to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Ty. <laughs> I was wondering how you could still be here, Ty. I'm like, wait, it's six o'clock, doesn't she need to go? Well, it's at seven and that's why she doesn't. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you.